for the introduction. I'm a reader in marine ecology and evolution um, based at the Institute of Marine Sciences at the University of Portsmouth. And um, I'm going to talk to you today about the science behind bringing back a forgotten ecosystem. Um, it's a marine ecosystem. So the marine research I do is based in the heart of the Solent. You know, many of you are, um, are from the Solent who are listening to this lecture, not all of you, perhaps. And um, this location here, right at the mouth of Langston Harbour, is where I work, the Institute of Marine Sciences. So it's a fantastic place to do marine research. Now, a lot of my research um, is around oysters. Now, this is a medieval drawing of an oyster. And I'm very glad that they don't actually look like that when I'm working with them because it looks fairly um, terrifying. But um, here we have two oysters that are found in the Solent. On the left, you've got the native oyster, Austria edulis. And then on the right, you've got the um, Pacific oyster or Crassostia gigas, sometimes called Magellana gigas, depending on who's done the evolutionary DNA analysis on it. So these are the, the, the two oysters that we find here in the Solent. And the native has got a, quite a big story behind it. And the Pacific's a, a recent in, invasive species to our shores. And it's slowly, um, well, actually very rapidly colonizing the shores all around Langston Harbour. And some of my research is on that, but I'm not gonna talk about that today. So there are lots of true oysters. In fact, there's 30 species of true oyster. And this is basically a family tree of all the different oysters on our planet of the true oysters. And uh, ours is here, Austria edulis. And the invasive one is the one down here, Cras Austria gigas. So they're completely unrelated other than a, a shared ancestor many, many, many years ago. So the native oysters are also called the mud oyster, the European oyster, the flat oyster. And we call it a sessile bivalve mollusk. And in sort of normal language, it just means it, it doesn't move unless um, when it's an adult and it just sits in the bottom of the sea with two shells. And it has a flat oyster shell and a sort of a cupped oyster shell like that. So that's where the flat oyster name comes from. This species is around 500 million years old and it's gregarious, which means it likes to settle on other species of its kind. And I'll talk about why that's really important in a minute but it's found all the way from sort of Norway down to Morocco into the Mediterranean. And there's a picture of it looking very happy on the seabed there. So here's some interesting facts about oysters. So um, they start off male and they improve becoming female around two years old. Um, but then again, they go back to male and female every single season. So they're called protandrous hermaphrodites, which is a really interesting way of dealing with reproduction. And every year when the water gets around 16 degrees, they start spawning. They have a reproductive period. And a female oyster can sort of spawn around a million larvae um, in one season. So the larvae are called D larvae because they look like the letter D. And what oysters do is they sit in the bottom of the sea and they filter out tiny bits of algae, plankton from the water column. And they can live up to 15 years or even longer. We found some really big ones in the Solent that are possibly up to sort of 20 years old or so. So when we talk about how an organism spends its life, it's called its life history or its reproductive cycle. And these are quite unique in their reproductive cycle. First of all, they change from male to female um, depending on environmental characteristics. Um, and so what happens is you get a, you get a, a young male and it releases some sperm into the water and the female oyster will sense this and bring it into its um, oyster cavity and then internalizes these eggs, um, internal fertilization of these eggs. And then you get this um, maturing or brooding of these, these eggs. And that little picture at the bottom is what's called white sick. That's what the fish is called white sick. And those are millions of young, tiny um, oyster larvae. And as they develop into these, what are called trochophore larvae, which are very beautiful under the microscope, they become this gray sick. And then when they're about to spawn, spit it out of the sea, they have this black sick. And it's just called that because it looks a bit like sick. That's what the fish is open it. So this is the reason why you don't eat an oyster in the months without an R, because basically you'll be eating millions of larvae. <laughs> 
Okay, so that's where the, uh, the rhyme comes from. And then these larvae go into the water columns, swim around and actively look for the best bit of the seabed they want to settle in and then completely change from a swimming larvae. They produce a cement, stick themselves to the surface and stay there for the rest of their lives. So some really interesting processes go on there. But anyway, I digress. So what, why do we want to work with oysters? We want to restore the native oyster habitat. We want to put lots of oysters back into the Solent. And I'm going to explain why we want to do that in a minute. But the, the background is that um, since the 1970s and before, there's been a biodiversity crisis. There's been a massive um, decrease in the planet's measure of biodiversity. And you can see this on this graph here. And we've also got alongside that, this climate crisis. And these are the warming stripes for the globe at the top here and the warming stripes for Europe. And these are the average temperatures from 1901 to 2019. As you can see, it's getting progressively warmer. So we have two crises compounding each other here. Now, what we do know that there's several things that can mitigate this biodiversity loss. And biodiversity is really important in our resilience, our future resilience as a planet. And as well as climate change action and cutting pollution, conservation or restoration is a really big way we can start to reverse this biodiversity decline. So there was this paper that came out around sort of eight years ago that did an analysis of all the oyster reefs in the world. And you probably didn't know that oyster reefs existed. They're like coral reefs, they're colder, slightly murkier. They're, they're in temperate, um, not tropical areas. And we have lost 85% of the world's oyster reefs. It's the world's most imperiled ecosystem. And this graph here shows you the state of the different oyster reefs. And where it's in dark red, or maroon or red, that means that the, the reefs that exist are either functionally extinct or in their very poor condition. And this means they've lost 95% of the population that was there. So huge, catastrophic losses of a habitat that we don't even remember what it looks like. That makes it quite hard to restore. So there's some pristine, well, there's some fairly good reefs left in um, South America, but North America, Europe and Australia have had these massive losses. And that's where the big restoration has been happening over the last 10, 20 years. So why do we, why do we want to do this? Why do we want to put back this lost habitat? Now, now occasionally you might see an oyster on the seabed, but they're so rare, there's none off the coast of Germany, for instance. We have no idea what it really looked like. It's not like coral reefs when we can imagine what a healthy coral reef really looks like because we've got videos of it. We don't have any records of what this habitat really looks like, but we do know what it, what it does because there's um, oyster reefs of similar species in, in different countries. So what do oysters do? You know, ecosystem services are the things that either an ecosystem or an organism do that are beneficial to humans. Things like providing food or regulating our climate or um, controlling pollution in the water. And oysters are really brilliant at controlling water quality, reducing algal blooms and, and increasing clarity of water, which is good for things like seagrasses. They increase fish production because they create this what's called biogenic habitat, um, lots of three-dimensional structure that other things can live on in between. Um, if you restore an oyster reef, you can have a spillover of the larvae into areas that are fished. Um, they can massively enhance biodiversity, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And one thing they do really well is denitrification, which they take um, nitrites and nitrates from the, from the water and then bring it down into the sediment. And that's a really important way of controlling the big um, pollution algal blooms from eutrophication, which is excess nutrients that come on from farmland. And um, just to illustrate that, we've got a little video here of some Crepidula fornicata, which I won't bore you with there, they're another invasive species, some native oyster here, and some algae, some phytoplankton in the tanks. And as you can see, in a couple of hours, the water goes from green, when, um, like it was when it started, to completely clear in the, in the tanks with the oysters. And that's just a few oysters doing it in a couple of hours 
on the benches in the Institute of Marine Sciences. So that demonstrates what they can do. Um, and in Chesapeake Bay, which is in America, um, the oyster reefs were so extensive, they used to be a, a hazard for ships. And Chesapeake Bay is incredibly large. And the oysters there used to cycle the whole water column every three days. And, you know, by the time they fished them out, it would take a year to do it. So there's other benefits, you know, it's good, good for recreational fishers, commercial fishers, the local economy, coastal communities, um, outreach, all, there's all sorts of benefits to restoration. So I'm just going to give you a little overview of sort of how we got to this point. So we've had a passion for oysters as humans. Um, you know, the humans have been cultivating oysters since the Roman times, and these are some, this is a mural here from, uh, from the Middle Ages, um, from, the, from the Roman era, and this shows an osterarium where they used to hang oysters on little strings here. Um, valuable oyster beds are documented in the Doomsday Book. Um, here's a pictures that this, this method had been used in, in, in Italy since the Romans until the latter 19th century. This is a, a picture from the Mediterranean in 1893, and you can see oyster aquaculture and people dredging. And what you can see is this sort of oyster reef here with lots of biodiversity, which we, we don't really find very often anymore. Now, this is a really interesting map by a guy called Olsen, and he created this Piscatorial Atlas, which is an atlas of the distribution of fishes. Who'd have thought such a thing existed? But it's beautiful and it does. And this map is of the North Sea in the UK. And everywhere you can see like a dark brown smudge is where there's extensive oyster reefs. Okay, so they were all around the coast. And there was a massive oyster reef in the, in the, in the North Sea um, between the UK and Denmark and English there. And it was around four to 34 meters deep. And we've almost completely removed that. Um, and, you know, you can see that all around the south coast, there were lots of oyster reefs and in the English Channel. Now, there was a massive demand for oysters. And this is a supply of fish to the London fish market in the late 1800s. And uh, it tells you the number of, of fish that year. And you can see that here there was 500 million oysters supplied to the London fish market that year of the native oyster. And so it wasn't just in the UK, in the, in the US East Coast, there was 27 million bushels, which are big baskets of oysters in, um, fished in the 1890s. Um, 100 million oysters per year in the early 19th century in France. In 1864, 700 million oysters were consumed in that year. And even up to the 1978 in the, in the Solent, we landed 15 million oysters. Now, this is a story of overfishing and disease. And I'm not going to go into lots of details, but this has happened with habitat and species um, degradation time and time again in, in different places. And basically, this is 1886, and these are the sort of um, thousand tons here. In 1886, there was um, like thousands and thousands of tons of oysters being landed in England and Wales. And, um, and it sort of diminished quite a lot until the 2000s. Um, went from 40 million to 20 million UK landings in, in from 1920 to 1950s. And part of that was this massive wave of disease that happened called Bonamia. And some of my research is around that. Now, if you go from the nine, this is the global landings of Austria edulis, the native oyster. And if you look at, this is sort of more recent, 1950 to 2010, there was only 550 tons landed globally in 2014. And this dotted line at the top were the 1887 landing in England and Wales. So it just shows you like, how many oysters we've taken out. So now they're protected species and they're protected habitat because we've completely taken them out. So it's a story of overfishing, which leads to removing something, which means lots of invasive species can come in and nick the space that they, they were originally occupied by a native species. Then what happens is that you get a genetic population bottleneck, like the amount of genetic diversity declines and therefore you're more vulnerable to disease. So waves of disease come through, happens in all sorts of things. Predators have a better go at you, so you're more vulnerable to those things. And that's sort of various predators, crabs and whelks and sponges 
and that means that there's less habitat, less shells of oysters for babies to settle on, and it goes round and round in a negative loop. And this is called the sliding baseline. And this is a really interesting concept that through the generations, you experience a progressively more impoverished environment. And therefore the biodiversity you see is what you think is pristine or normal, and yet it is far less biodiverse than historically. And so you lose a memory of these things. And so that's a really important point you have to think about when you're doing conservation. So a really morbid start to the talk, um, well, most of the talk, but I'm just gonna spend the next five minutes um, showing what we're doing in the UK, in the Solent and Europe to reverse this trend, because it's not rocket science, it's easily fixable. It is completely doable with the will and the money and the expertise, and we're going to do it. So I established the Native Oyster Network um, with the Zoological Society of London in 2017, and there was a European equivalent of this set up um, almost at the same time, and we work really closely together. And we're creating common goals to have this European approach to completely restoring this almost lost habitat. So it's a European scale, but I also work with people in America and Australia. It's a global movement. We've got government engagement, we're going to change policy, and we're creating the strategy to face this challenge. So we've got these aims as a network, which um, I'm not gonna read out, but part of it is to increase the awareness of the value of oysters, which is one of the reasons why I'm sitting here today, as well as um, loving all things STEM. Now, a lot of there are currently 18 projects across Europe um, of, in doing oyster restoration. And at the Solent and the Essex in the UK, we're one of the largest. We're really leading the way. And we're on the, on the tip of upscaling this, and the funding is coming in in the pipeline. You know, there's lots of really exciting things around that. We've just published this Habitat Restoration Handbook, came out this year, and this is a practical guide that we've written um, for restoration practitioners and governments, how to restore native oyster habitat. So we've got the how-to guide now. That's literally hot of the press, and there's a link at the bottom here if you want to go and have a look at it. All these lots of lovely infographics were made for it, and they're really good for communication. Now, making sure we don't spread more invasive species or more disease is really important. So we also wrote a handbook on biosecurity. That's a big thing when you're moving organisms around from marine environment. And the Solent Restoration Project, which I'm going to give you a very quick overview now, started sort of as a glint in the eye in 2014. And over the last few years, we've been sort of trialling various things. We've been putting broodstock cages in marinas to pump larvae out into the Solent. Um, we've put 20,000 oysters in the seabed as part of a trial to get permission to be doing more. And um, in, we're building a restoration hatchery, so breeding oysters at the IMS at the moment. And next year, we're going to put 2 million oysters onto the seabed. And we're going to go towards 5 million oysters at optimal sites across the Solent. We're also combining this with salt marsh restoration. And there's a pretty picture of some of the sites that we're working in across the, um, the Solent, um, and with the red dots are every place we have these broodstock cages, which I'll explain very briefly in a minute. This is my PhD student, Luke, covered in mud. He's now finished, he's a doctor, he's working for Blue Marine Foundation, leading some restoration projects. And what we do, we, we created these really cool oyster cages or oyster love hotels to try and increase the density. So they all breed and they pump out loads of larvae. And it worked pretty well. And now we're rolling that out across the UK in this massive wild, wild oysters project. So that's going to be in marinas all across the UK. We found over 96 species living with these cages, including the critically endangered European eel. That's one that absolutely terrified us when it jumped out of the cage. <laughs> we weren't expecting it. Um, and so we've estimated that even those oysters in those cages have filtered five billion litres of water, they've produced over a billion larvae, and we've found um, more than 100 species, and we've engaged with over 500 school children and volunteers, and it's just the beginning. So this is one of my papers, which you don't need to know about. One thing we really want to find out about is 
is it just the cages or is it the oysters that cause all these fish? We see loads of fish associated with them. So I'm doing an experiment at the moment and pilot data shows that actually there's something about the oysters that's not, just not the three dimensional cage. So this is an experiment you have to replicate, you have to do experimental design and that's going on at the moment. And these are lots of lovely animals. These are all the animals we saw with the cages and lovely seahorses and bass and all sorts of things. We're also trying to restore salt marsh by putting these really fantastic potato starch based structures to stop salt marsh erosion and help oyster reef colonization. And this is beginning to do integrated coastal restoration. So you restore two ecosystems at the same time. And that picture of me in a hat is when I was in Chesapeake Bay in America, learning how to do this with the Crassosia virginica, the eastern oyster in America, and how they do it with large scale salt marsh restoration. So it's that knowledge transfer across the world, which is really important for cutting edge science. We're also doing lots of really clever stuff with genetics um, and trying to find out how we can identify the genes that show oysters are resistant to that horrible disease, monamia, that can wipe out populations. We're also trying to see, we're doing experiments to find out how many nutrients, sort of nitrogen and phosphates, oysters can actually draw down to try and control some of the pollution in the solent. So this big project called Rapid Reduction of Nutrients in Transitional Waters, snappy, isn't it? Called RANTRANS. We're going to start see if we can use um, oysters to bioremediate, um, biologically remove some of this pollution. And as I said before, we're also developing this um, research hatchery at the Institute of Marine Sciences to understand some of the larval behaviour and uh, the effects of how close oysters really need to be on the seabed to reproduce really well. Um, so um, the last thing is I talked at the beginning about ecosystem services, you know, how oysters can sort of um, remove nitrates and phosphates and, and clean the water. Now, what you can do is sometimes you can put a value, a financial value on this. And there's, cos, and there's pros and cons to doing this, but this is called natural capital. And we did a study to work out um, how much the, the, the different habitats that are found in the solent, so seagrasses, salt marshes and oysters, um, if you had to pay for the amount of nitrogen they remove by their existence, how much would it cost? And so what we found out that the, the fairly degraded habitats in the Solent remove 1.2 billion pounds worth of nitrogen every year just by being there and 195 million pounds worth of phosphorus. We've obviously got a paper behind this of interest in the, the ins and outs. The other thing is because this is a forgotten ecosystem, we did this big UK wide search to, for people to sending photos from around Europe actually to show us, give us examples of what an oyster reef might look like. And here's a few pretty pictures of some healthy oysters. And uh, one of the divers who's a very good photographer. That's just finished and we're deciding on the winning, winning photo at the moment. So a really good engagement opportunity. Great, well, that's me. That's some of the stuff I do. Thank you very much for listening. Of course, it's not just me. It's a whole team of fantastic people who I work with at the ZSL, at the Marine Foundation, at Marinas, at different universities, and my lab at the Institute of Marine Sciences.